Matthew chapter 2 being the fact that, uh, again, last week we went back to Matthew, did kind of a little of the background, did the genealogy in the first 17 verses, uh, and saw the <clears throat> really the graciousness of God in, in that genealogy, and uh, talked about the fact that Matthew is, is making sure that he is presenting uh, the genealogy of the king, his royal uh, lineage, his royal line through what would be his adopted father, Joseph as opposed to his bloodline, which would be through Mary, uh, that's presented in, in the book of Luke. You can certainly say at least from the birth and so forth. Uh, Matthew gives you the perspective of Joseph. Luke gives you the perspective uh, of Mary. So there's different things covered, different things that are uh, emphasized. And uh, one of the things that's uh, presented here is the appearance of the wise men or the, the magi, that, uh, or magi that come from the, the east to uh, appear to Jesus. And in going through this, it, um, it certainly uh, may or may not make you change uh, your manger scene. We just kind of leave ours. It comes as a set. But we'll see that the, uh, that the wise men were not there at the birth of Christ. They, they come sometime later. Uh, things have, uh, you know, died down in Bethlehem. The census is over. People have gone back to where they lived before. It's not the packed, crowded conditions. Certainly Joseph and Mary and Jesus are not living out in the uh, out in a cave somewhere, like uh, probably where the, quote, the manger was that Jesus was uh, uh, born in. They're probably living in a home. He's probably at least a year or so old at, uh, at this point in time. And, and of course, then the, the star that's over that manger scene would not have been there yet either. Uh, that is the star that's leading uh, these men from, from the east. Uh, because they present three gifts, we even get the idea that there are three of them. And by the Middle Ages, we've even got them named <laughs> and everything. But uh, you don't pack up a lot of wealth and three guys on three camels and, and head off on a year's journey, you know, across uh, through uh, Iraq and Iran and so forth to get to, uh, uh, to uh, Jerusalem. Uh, these would have been very wealthy, very distinguished men. They would have traveled with a very large entourage, and, and there could have been dozens or a, a dozen or more wise men, but we just kind of note the three gifts that are, that are here. So as you pack your nativity scene up this year, you can make those necessary adjustments. Or maybe not, just keep it all together. But that's where we're at. Uh, in terms of uh, 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 who they were, we've kind of been introduced to them because of our study in Daniel. We kind of just referred to them then in terms of Daniel having to deal with this idea of these wise men that would have been appointed and, and surrounded the, uh, uh, the rulers. And again, Daniel served as one of them during the Babylonian kingdom as well as through the, the, the uh, four rulers of the Persian kingdom. And uh, uh, he was there. And, uh, and certainly his writings, the things that he said, this large Jewish contingency in, in Persia would have remained with some of their writings and, and, uh, and may have been a direct influence on the idea of uh, these guys coming from that part of the world to look for a Messiah or a king that was to be, uh, to be born. We also know that we've got um, uh, back in Numbers recorded uh, another Gentile prophet named uh, Balin who predicts uh, the fact that uh, from Judah uh, a king would arise and so forth. And so they may have been uh, very uh, aware of that prophecy as well. But uh, in addition to that, they just, there was just a, a feeling uh, at that time in the world that something was going to happen. Uh, that a king was coming. So I want to read a couple of quotes from uh, Roman historians. Uh, Suetonius once said that uh, about this period, uh, there had spread over the Orient an old and established belief that it was fated at that time for men coming from Judea to rule the world. So these are secular guys that are writing uh, just the conversation, just the, the talk, that there was some anticipation that something was going to happen, a ruler was going to rise out of, out of Judea, which is kind of unlikely. Again, they're living under the oppression of the Roman rule. 
Uh, they had a little brief period under the Maccabeans and Judas Maccabean that we studied about uh, in the Hashmonian dynasty. But that ends up being put down by the Romans, and they're living under tremendous oppression. So it wasn't that there were they could look around Judea and say, hey, I think something's going to happen. But despite the circumstances, there was that, that sense. Um, uh, Tacitus, uh, again, another Roman historian, said uh, there was a firm persuasion uh, that at this very time the East was to grow powerful. Land the rulers coming from Judea were to acquire uh, and make a universal empire. So again, uh, there was a lot of uh, secular anticipation of, of some kind of ruler. Whether the Magi, these guys were aware of that and probably were as kind of building or leading, but we, of course we know that they, they came because the, the star in the, would have been west to them. Their traveling from the east was, uh, was leading them. I don't know how to compare it, but we might think about uh, Y2K. You know, there was a little anticipation, you know, that something was going to happen, you know, at Y2K and so forth. Uh, and everybody was talking about it and, and everything. So that, uh, that might be a, a similar kind of thing of what's going on here. Don't know exactly, but something's going to happen. It has something to do with Judea, has something to do with the ruler, has something to do with a king being born. It's just kind of was the anticipation of the discussion of, of the, the secular world in the Middle East uh, at, uh, at this time. Uh, and again, one of the things we were going to emphasize is that uh, these these wise men coming were just uh, again they would have uh, we would have um, uh, uh, they would have been you know scientists, mathematicians, uh, you know uh, uh, astronomers, and so forth. Uh, but beyond that, they were just your run of the mill pagans <laughs> as well in terms of their religious practices and beliefs and so forth. But despite that, when they made some move towards God. Uh, he revealed himself to them. Uh, and they didn't have a lot to go on, but the little bit that they followed, God used it to draw them to, uh, to Jesus Christ. And, uh, and we'll see their response uh, here uh, at the end. Let's take a look at the, at the text. And again, it's the first 12 verses uh, of Matthew chapter 2. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them, Where is the Christ? Uh, excuse me, asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem, Judea, they replied, For this is what the prophet uh, has written. But you, uh, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and of incense and of myrrh, and having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. So uh, again, some are disturbed by this news, and one of them certainly is, uh, is Herod. Uh, one of the things we'll, we'll look at that Matthew is contrasting here is Herod, who's appointed king, versus Jesus, who is born to be the king. Herod's, uh, again, Herod the Great, not great because he was a great guy, uh, great because of the, uh, the buildings and the uh, architecture and, uh, that are uh, that you can visit in Israel today, at least in terms of the archaeological remains, and some, there's some incredible things uh, uh, that are there. But uh, it was said at that time, it was uh, you were safer being Herod's pig than you were his son. This guy was a very brutal guy. He was a very jealous person. Uh, he executed three of his own sons. He executed his mother. He executed his wife because he was jealous of them. They might try to take power, so you just kill them. Uh, he was... He was a very wicked individual. As we'll see towards the end of this chapter, as we look at it next week, uh, when he realizes he's kind of been duped by the wise men, 
and they didn't come back, and he doesn't know which one of these kids in Bethlehem might be Jesus, might be the king. He just kills them all two years and uh, under in the vicinity around that area in order to make sure uh, that... Uh, that uh, there's no threat of another king being born. Now, it's interesting in a parallel passage in the book of Revelation, it talks about the birth of Jesus. It's using symbolic language as it does uh, there in, uh, in Revelation. And it talks about the, the mother who is Israel giving birth to the child, which is Jesus, and the dragon who is right there waiting to, to, uh, to kill him. And, uh, and of course, that dragon is not a reference to Herod himself, but Satan. So... Uh, Again, very satanically driven person that's in power over Israel, or over Jerusalem, over Judea uh, during this time. Uh, his kingdom, well, he's been appointed by the Roman government. Half Jewish, half Edomite uh, is uh, King Herod. Uh, and he's there uh, with incredible jealous, jealousy. And he's disturbed by this news uh, that a king has been born. Uh, contrast again, Jesus who was born to be king. And uh, in him being born uh, at this time, uh, the, again, as we talked about Mary uh, being the mother of the Messiah, uh, every young girl in, in uh, Israel was hoping to be the mother of Messiah. They were anticipating uh, the Messiah being born, but uh, the Messiah to them would have been the fulfillment. Again, there's, there's prophecies of the Messiah coming who would be the, the ruling king who will set up his kingdom and so forth. So they're like, now would be a really good time as they're being oppressed by, by the Romans uh, as, um, uh, you know, their property is confiscated, taken away, and, uh, you know, and they're just uh, at times brutally treated by, uh, by the Romans and uh, working hard in their fields but having to pay, you know, exorbitant taxes and, uh, and so on and so forth. And they're living under that day and night and they're thinking, man, this would be a great time for the king, uh, our coming king, to come on the scene. I had a, a, a knock on the door the other day, and two lovely Jehovah's Witnesses uh, uh, were, ladies were there, and, and one of the things they like to talk to you about is the coming kingdom. Again, the, the Jews were anticipating, and as you read through, and there's great details about this kingdom that, that the Messiah will establish. We believe, of course, yet future. Uh, they believe future as well, uh, and so we began, that's what they wanted to share about, and we talked about that a little bit, and I told them, that's great. So you believe that Jesus will come and establish his kingdom here one day. And I, and I know what they believe. And I said, and you guys, and I agree with you on that. And they, oh, great. You know, and, and they, I said, and you believe that Jesus is the son of God who died for your sins. And I believe that as well. Oh, and so we agree on that. And yeah. I said, but where we differ is that I believe that he's not just the son of God, but he's God the son. And you don't believe that as well. And, of course, we go into who Jehovah is and because they deny the Trinity as well. So we talked about that. I said, but you know what Jesus said about this coming kingdom that you believe in and believe he's the son of God? He said, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he's born again. Are you two ladies born again? Oh, you're one of those kind of Christians. And then we went into this whole thing about the, they, they designate you as a born again Christian. Then that means you actually believe your Bible and. Uh, you know, espouse to have a, a personal relationship with them. It also usually means they're not going to get very far with you. Uh, they love it if you've had some exposure to Christianity or maybe grew up, uh, you know, with the Bible a little bit, but doesn't, don't really know what it says. They, they love that kind of a, a person. So uh, it, was, it was fun. And I, uh, my recommendation is just be as kind as, as you can to them because they're not expecting it. When people are, are, are kind of uh, uh, put them out, slam the door in their face, kind of mean and all that, they walk away going, praise the Lord, I've been persecuted. <laughs> they they kind of get some going. They, they love that because they've been told this is what's going to happen. This is how people are going to treat you. So when you're really kind and really nice to them, they, they just can't get over it. You know? and, uh, and what you want to try to do then is explained that since I'm born again, I have a personal relationship with Christ. This is what Christ has done to me. He's changed my life. This is what I used to be like. This is how I, because they don't have a personal relationship with him at all. They're just religious and they're, uh, they're out there lost. Uh, so, but they want to talk about the coming kingdom. The Jews were expecting the coming kingdom uh, as well. And they expected their Messiah to be a military ruler. They were looking for another Hashmonian dynasty. They're looking for another, you know, hammer to come in. 
uh, and uh, just like the ones that drove out Antiochus Epiphanes and that we've studied about in, in Daniel. That's who they're, they're looking for. They've got an appointed king. Jesus was born to be king, uh, but not the way that they were looking for. But then there's the wise men. The wise men, again, had some history of the Jews. Uh, they knew that their history was one of deliverance as well as judgment, uh, as well as the, the miraculous. Uh, they uh, probably, again, had in mind Balaam's prophecy uh, that, you know, out, you know the, the star would lead them, that out of Judah the Messiah would be born and so forth. Uh, but what it tells us about uh, these wise men uh, is that they were seeking after God. They were genuinely seeking after God. Uh, and also, they had, they had some belief or some belief uh, in the Word of God, even though they, they didn't have a lot of it. Uh, but they probably had in mind Balaam's prophecy, which is a portion of the Word of God, one verse, Numbers 24, 17. Uh, they may have had some of uh, Daniel's prophecy uh, uh, that they have heard about and so forth. But uh, 1 Chronicles 28, 9 tells us this, For the Lord searches the, every heart and understands every motive behind the thoughts. If you seek him, he will be found by you. James says, come near to God and he'll come near to you. And that's what the wise men were doing. So again, you've got a, a, a very wicked ruler uh, over Judea at this time who's very disturbed. I mean, disturbed like, I need to kill this guy, you know, in terms of the news of Jesus' birth. Uh, you've got the religious establishment uh, that even according to all Jewish uh, historians, it was absolutely corrupt at this time. And again, so they're ruling o over the people. The, again, the, the Sadducees and the Pharisees that were ruling in Jerusalem, that, that's not indicative of, uh, of uh, the Jewish people living uh, in, uh, in Israel at that time. The Bible tells us that they heard Jesus gladly. And, and, of course, we know that the early church responded by the thousands uh, after the uh, resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, and those guys are, again, the Pharisees and the Sadducees are, are just very uh, in, indifferent uh, to this whole thing. When, uh, when it's reported to them, Herod calls them in and says, Oh, these guys just showed up. They said the king's been born, uh, the, the Jewish king. Where will he be born? Hey, we're not really sure. We'll get back to you on that. We know we got that written down somewhere. That, that's not what they do. They go, Bethlehem. And they quote the scriptures to them. They know exactly. These guys knew the word of God. But it uh, never had any impact on their lives. Jesus would later say to the same group that you err because you don't know the scriptures nor the power of God. I mean, they had a knowledge of it, but it was never a personal knowledge. Uh, and yet, of all of these characters in this story it's these guys that are traveling from persia probably for a year uh in order to get there for the birth of jesus uh that uh that uh ends up worshiping him and, and bringing their treasures and uh and so on and so forth a lot of times when we're sharing with people we do get that that idea well that's great well you've heard the gospel and you know jesus but you know, it's usually, what about this group of people over here? Or how's God going to deal with, you know, it's always the pygmies in Africa, you know, kind of a thing. You used to know a guy that actually made a track, the pygmies in Africa. You know how God, oh, you read about the pygmies in Africa. Well, here's a track you can read about that. Uh, concerned about that, people that haven't heard the gospel. Well, you can say, well, there's the wise men in the Bible. Uh, you know, they didn't have much in terms of the scriptures. They certainly weren't born in a Christian country and, uh, and so forth. But the little that they had, if they were seeking after God, then God revealed himself uh, to them. We were talking about, uh, <clears throat> within the Truth Project, we were talking about that idea of the separation of general revelation and special revelation. Again, they had general revelation. God reveals himself in terms of creation. They didn't have much in the way of special revelation. But about uh, uh, 90 to 95% of all what we call folk religions all have some remnant belief of that God created the earth. Most of them have some source or, or sort of Adam and Eve story in the fall. Most of them have a story of a flood and uh, a Noah-like uh, Noah figure and so forth. About 90 to 95% of, of folk religions around, around the world. And, uh, and for many of them that have held to them and were not influenced by other than world religions that came in, whether it was Hinduism, Islam, or, uh, or 
Buddhism and so forth, it actually kept them open and prepared for the gospel. There was a, a group living in northern uh, Burma that because of those basic beliefs they had in their folk religion, refused to worship Buddha. They refused Buddhism, uh, for, which becomes the national religion. And under persecution, they refused to become Buddhists for a thousand years until missionaries got there with the gospel to tell them about the God who is the creator and the, yes, they have sin, and that's why you know, there was the flood, and they tie it all together and present Jesus to them. And whew, I mean, all of them, you know, receive the gospel. You know, again, even uh, repeating the story of the, uh, the Hawaiians here uh, in the islands and in the spiritual vacuum that the missionaries arrived in uh, here as well. But again, uh, for the Lord searches every heart, understands every motive behind the thoughts. If you seek him, uh, he will be found by you. So, the one thing we know about these guys is they were genuinely seeking after God. Let's go back to Herod a minute. The third thing, Herod disturbed by the news, verse 3. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed in all Jerusalem uh, with him. And certainly that continues to be the, uh, the case sometimes a day. There's uh, different reactions to the gospel, different reactions to our sharing uh, uh, about Jesus and who he is and so forth. Uh, people continue sometimes to be the reaction of of a Herod continue to be disturbed uh, by it. It's, you know, we say that within school today we have the ABCs, anything but Christ. You know, you can pretty much uh, say or, or talk about any religious f uh, figure other than Jesus. And again, the chief priests and the scribes who are simply uh, indifferent. They might be described as the postmodernists of today. <laughs> they they want to pretty much hang on to their position, their power, their wealth, and, uh, and everything. And so there's no room for Jesus, even if he is the Messiah. Actually, when you come down to it, even if they realize he is, you get a sense that even if he is, they don't care. They want him killed in the end as well because... Because who they were, and they had wealth. You know, when you uh, go to uh, Jerusalem today, you can go to the archaeological remains of, of Caiaphas's palace. He didn't live in a house. He lived in a palace. They were wealthy, and they were in control. And those things prevented them from coming to, to Christ. There's things that prevent people from coming to Christ uh, today uh, that cause them sometimes to be uh, disturbed, angry. Uh, like Herod, sometimes it's just an indifference. Well, that's true for you, but it's not really true for me. Uh, that's really great. You know, uh, that's what you're doing. That's what you're into. Terrific. But, you know, here's my truth. I see it differently. And for the scribes and the Pharisees, they were kind of the postmodernists of, of their days. But the wise men keep searching for the one who is worthy of worship. So there are some disturbed by the news. And secondly, in verses 4 to 8, uh, some were directed to, to the king. Uh, and again, the wise men limited in terms of their direction. Uh, we see that they end up going to Jerusalem because uh, uh, they really don't know the word of God. Uh, they, they don't really have that, the specifics. Uh, they're pretty much going on, on, a, on a few little tidbits of information, uh, the belief that there is a, a God that's out there that created everything, and this one star that now is, I believe, supernaturally there uh, that's appeared because, as we see in the text, it stops over the house where, notice it's not the manger anymore, it stops over the house where uh, Jesus is. I haven't noticed too many stars stopping you know, but uh, anyway, it uh, supernaturally leads them there, but uh, very limited in terms of uh, what they had, but going with, with what God had uh, provided. But uh, again, this is in contrast to the chief priests and the teachers of the law that had the scriptures that didn't need to look up Micah 5 to. They knew exactly where Jesus would be, uh, would be born. And uh, so, uh, again, a tremendous difference between those that are, have uh, available to them specific revelation, the Word of God. That was kind of one of the emphasis in our study in the Truth Project uh, last week, that God is, is uh, so immense when we talk about creation, holy and righteous and so forth. And if He had not revealed Himself to us, we absolutely would not know him. We would absolutely never come to the conclusions that we can come to because in his love and his grace, he's chosen to reveal himself to us in the scriptures uh, and in the person of, uh, of Christ. But it's a good thing to think through. What keeps people from coming to faith in Christ? Uh, it, it's interesting. Sometimes it's just different things. I, I think for me, I mean, I grew up in the church. 
Uh, so I, maybe I'm more like the Pharisees and the Sadducees because uh, I was kind of indifferent to the whole thing. And it was okay that some people were Christians. It was okay that I had friends that were Christians. It just wasn't for me because I kind of wanted to do my own thing. I, I had this uh, 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 framework uh, of mind that, that I thought that, uh, man, if I became a Christian, uh, that means I've got to really follow Jesus and do what he tells me to do. I understand the concept of lordship, you know. I, I, I got that part. And uh, I didn't think you could be a Christian and then just kind of live <laughs> totally disobedient to the Lord and give a rip <laughs> what, he, what he said. I kind of understood that it was kind of a package deal. If you give him your life, you give him your life. It's like, that means like, what do you want me to do? And so uh, I didn't want to do that because I didn't really trust him. And I, I pictured him telling me that I had to be a missionary in some foreign country and pictured myself going down the Amazon, you know, with my pith helmet on. And I can imagine the, the wife that he would have for me for this journey, you know, some, and uh, I don't want to get descriptive, but you know, it wasn't, it wasn't a good picture. It wasn't a good picture, you know, uh, because we don't know the Lord. I mean, he, he knows us. He knows that, uh, again, it's delight yourself in the Lord. He'll give you the desires of your heart. Trust in him and he'll do it, you know. But again, he'll come in and, and give you his desires, you know, so that the life that you're living is, is really worth living. I think of the scripture that uh, Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians where he says, we really live because you're standing firm in the Lord. You know, how can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy we have in the presence of our God because of you? Paul says, you know what's real living? Man, doing something for the Lord and then, you know, pouring your life into somebody, seeing them do well. He says, that's real living. And he says, man, uh, he's talking about his worship, being in the presence of God and how great it is because of not just this isolated, well, I have a relationship with the Lord and I don't care about anybody else, but because he's poured his life into somebody else. Uh, again, no, uh, no regrets on this end, but uh, giving my life to the Lord, wanting to serve, serve the Lord. But uh, it's funny, the things that the misconceptions that keep people from a relationship with, with God. Sometimes it's just, <laughs> they're Herods. And it's like, okay, I better pray for that guy. <laughs> He's just mean and wicked. All right, you know. Uh, there's other people that just have this indifference. And they've had some exposure, but they kind of don't, don't really get it. And uh, again, the classic I example might be uh, in the Old Testament, the story of David, who uh, uh, typically when he, when he came uh, to his throne as a king, what most kings did is then whoever the previous king was, you went out and killed all their descendants, right? Because you don't want them rising up and leading some rebellion against you. And, uh, and uh, the descendants of Saul, that was kind of anticipated. Uh, most of them have been killed on the battlefield, as you remember, but there was one young guy that had it. His name was Methuselah. Methuselah, uh, he's a little kid when David uh, takes the throne, and so Methuselah's nurse grabs him, and we find later running with him falls, and the kid ends up being crippled, but they hide him so David won't kill him. Well, after all the battles are done, his throne is established and, uh, and so forth, and there's peace in the land, David sends word out, you know, is there any descendants of Saul that are still here? Why? He wants to bring them in and treat them like his own family because of a covenant relationship that he had made with Jonathan and uh, Saul's other son, his good friend. And he finds Methuselah, and, and as the story goes, they bring him in, and, and, uh, and he's shocked to find out that he thinks he's coming for his execution. And David say, no, here, sit, sit at my table, eat with me every day. I'm restoring to you all your fields and your properties. I want to treat you like one of my own sons. Well, might have come earlier. Instead of <laughs> in hiding, but he didn't know the character of the king. He didn't understand the idea of a covenant relationship. And, and there's a lot of people out there today. Uh, they're indifferent. They know a little bit, but they don't know enough about the character of God. They don't understand this idea of the covenant relationship that God wants to make with us. It's not because of anything that we could do or have done. It's just out of his grace and his mercy and his love for us that he establishes a relationship with us. And sometimes, again, we need to be the ones that are those ambassadors that are sharing that, not the bad news, but the, the good news. That's what the gospel means with those around us, those that are in, indifferent. Just stay away from the Herod guys, just pray for them. <laughs> but, uh, but God can use us in the lives of so many others. Secondly, God's, again, uh, he, uh, given a specific direction to the king. 
and uh, we can be thankful for that. We've got his revealed word. Uh, Paul says in uh, Romans 1.20 about this idea of general revelation. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that men are without excuse. No one on the judgment day is going to stand before God and go, I didn't know. <laughs> I didn't know there was a God. Oh, come on, you didn't tell me. And he goes, no, uh, my nature, my eternal power are, are clearly seen. People have to really bend, bend their heads the other way to, uh, to not know that, uh, that there is a creator that's out there. Uh, the, 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 the world is a mechanism, you know, everything is, is built in, in order and so forth. And, uh, and it's obvious to everyone. Paul says they'll be without excuse uh, in the end. But again, that's not what directs our lives. Again, we have God's word, his specific word of God, and we've got the Holy Spirit uh, with us that Paul says will, as Jesus said, will teach us, will remind us, as Paul says, will lead us and guide us. Paul says uh, it's like an umpire, says, you're out, you're safe. I mean, again, don't go here, but go this way, leading and, and guiding us. We have this specific revelation of, of God's word. These guys, you have to admire the, the wise men who had so little uh, and yet traveled so far on a hope so, on a hope that maybe there is a king. Maybe this star really is leading us. Uh, we've got so much more than that. Thirdly, in verses 9 to 12, some were desperate to respond to the king. And it says, on coming to the house, they saw the child. And again, we've noted that it's a house now. It's, the, it's not the, uh, the manger scene. Uh, it's not the baby Jesus. It's the child uh, Jesus. And uh, how long of a, of, a, of a sequence of events that have transpired, we don't really know. We do know it would have taken them about a year to, uh, to make this journey before they get there. Uh, it was no hop, skip, and a jump. And they, uh, when they get there, we see that the wise men responded in, in worship. Very different response than Herod. Very different response than the chief priests and the teachers uh, of the law. And, um, and again, this is the, uh, the place that we should all come to, to have a relationship with God, is to a desire to worship Him. And certainly that's what we uh, do as we gather. It's certainly something we can do daily. Uh, in our, our lives, but uh, it's a picture of God, uh, again, meeting people right where, where they're at. Uh, someone has said that if God were a thousand feet away, he's run 999 to get to you. Will you take the one to him? Uh, he still doesn't make us into little robots and, uh, and demand because uh, the worship is tied into the worship. He is worthy, but it's also tied into a love relationship that he desires to have uh, with us. And then secondly, the wise men respond with their treasure. Uh, and again, very important, gold, uh, because that was customary to bring to a king that spoke of his royalty and so forth uh, to be uh, anticipated, uh, would speak of his life as a king. Frankincense is unusual because that's a gift for a priest. Uh, it's what they used to make incense. It would be burnt in the temple. So now you have very unusual combination of someone who is a king, but someone is a priest. And remember in the Old Testament, those two offices could never come together. When someone tried, it didn't ever work, as you remember King Saul. Uh, but with Jesus, he is the unique king and priest. Paul says uh, in 1 Timothy 2, 4, there's one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave his life as a ransom for many, the testimony given in its proper time. There's a, um, uh, the third gift is uh, unusual as well, and that's uh, myrrh, which speaks of his death. So again, you've got gold for a king, Joseph and Mary. Again, they've had their both, uh, you know, the angels appear to them in their dreams and so forth. Uh, they make this arduous journey all the way down to, to Bethlehem. Uh, they get there and probably a little bit in their own minds going, Okay, man, I'm hoping we're doing the right thing here, you know, uh, and then uh, there's no room for them, you know, and then there, that wasn't a comfortable thing um, to, uh, for her to give birth in a stable. And then the shepherds show up, and they've got this testimony that God appeared to them, this whole chorus in heaven, give glory to God in the highest and so forth, and, and they're, they're all excited and everything. That had to be like, <laughs> all right, okay, we're, we're good. Do you ever follow the Lord and think, 
I sure hope this is really God directing me uh, to do this, to take that job, to go here or whatever, some of the bigger things in, in life. Uh, so that was probably very, very confirming. So it's been a while. Things have settled down, maybe a year, maybe a year and a half later. Uh, and, uh, and now uh, these guys show up with, again, a whole entourage. There, there could have been 30, 40, 50, 75 of these guys that, uh, that show up. And, um, uh, and, and as uh, they come and bring these gifts of gold, it's like, all right, he really is going to be the king. Incense, very interesting, because he's got to be the, the priest. The priest is the one that can stand before the people on behalf of God, but then go back and stand to God on behalf of the people. And, uh, and that earthly priest there in the, the temple was so limited, but Jesus, the, the God-man come in the flesh so that he can relate to us, uh, becomes the perfect mediator. But then there's the myrrh that speaks of his death. Now remember, the other scene that we've got in Luke, from Mary's perspective, they've already taken Jesus in the temple to have him dedicated and so forth. And they have the prophecy or, you know, of, of, uh, of Simeon and, uh, and uh, Anna and so forth. And, and there's already the mention uh, of the fact that, uh, uh, that Mary's heart, you know, will be pierced, you know, in, in the future. She had to be pondering that, and now you have this very strange gift of myrrh, which used for embalming. It speaks of death. So you've got gold, you've got frankincense, and then you've got the, the myrrh. There's kind of a, a, a classic um, painting by Holman Hunt. Uh, Holman Hunt was um, a guy that uh, kind of what was called pre-Raphael. He was, uh, if you saw his work, uh, if you're an old guy like me and you went to Sunday school as a kid, you might have seen his copies of his stuff hanging up in a Sunday school room somewhere. Uh, because he really never made it big in the artistic world until he started doing, quote, religious paintings and so forth. And his work was copied and duplicated in a, in a lot of uh, Sunday school and uh, curriculum and stuff in the, in, the, in the 50s and everything. But uh, there's a classic uh, painting of his, of Jesus uh, kind of as an adult in his carpenter shop, and he's working there on his bench and apparently the, the sun is, is drifting down, and he's looking into it, and he kind of raises his hands for a moment uh, as though he's reaching up for something. Uh, and then uh, with the sun on him lit up, it, it forms a, a, the shadow, the silhouette behind him against a wall where there's a big timber that happens to be going across. So you can see that behind him. And then there's a woman, presumably Mary, like on a knee, and she happens to catch a glimpse of seeing the shadow of Jesus stretched out over a timber, just in, in the shadow form. And, um, and the idea, obviously, is there by the artist that Mary had to constantly be pondering this idea of her son's impending death, but trying to understand that, trying to figure that out. Uh, and yet uh, it comes uh, very early in terms of his being in the temple uh, and now with these three wise men are the three gifts of the wise men uh, in terms of the the myrrh jesus born to be a king also born to be a priest uh, but certainly to be the king priest that would die for our sins uh, isaiah makes an interesting prophecy in isaiah 60 and it's talking about the, the messianic kingdom that kingdom that will come in the future uh, the kingdom that we'll all be part of uh, as believers, that we return to planet Earth with Christ, even as we've studied in the book of Daniel. Uh, Jesus will sit on a throne and rule from Jerusalem, and, uh, and we will we'll go visit <laughs> occasionally, at least three times a year. All the feast days will kick in as memorials to Jesus and so forth. Uh, and uh, it's interesting, Isaiah talks about a time in that setting when gifts are being brought to Jesus. And it says this in Isaiah 66. Herds of camels will cover your land. Young camels of Media and Ephah and all from Sheba will come bearing gold and incense and proclaiming the praise of the Lord. What's interesting is there's no myrrh. Uh, there's going to come a time, uh, there was a time when, when it was gold and it was, uh, you know, the frankincense and the myrrh but when Jesus establishes his kingdom in the future, death won't be part of that. There'll just be the honoring of him as a king and as a priest. Uh, in terms of them opening their treasure, for us, I think the application is, um, Jesus said, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And I think that's what 
the Lord's really uh, interested in. He's really interested uh, in, in our hearts. Uh, we come, we worship Him. Uh, we come, we open our hearts to Him. Uh, but again, not because of the treasure we can give to Him, but because of the treasure He's still wanting to give to us. Uh, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. What you cherish, what's important in your heart, your mind, your thought life, where you place things, you know, that's, that's going to be the thing that really dominates your, your life at, at some point in time. And, uh, and for us, it, it should be the Lord. Uh, and as we do that, as we open our hearts to Him, uh, He's the one that ends up giving the, the treasures to us. I just wanted to uh, close with this quote from Michael Card and... Um, from a a book he wrote several years ago called Emmanuel Reflections on the Life of Christ. And of the wise men, he says, the Bible simply says they bowed down and worshiped him. Perhaps they were silent because they recognized in the little baby a wisdom that was beyond their stammering words. Instead of pondering the mystery of this wisdom, they fell on their knees and worshiped. They must have felt a great relief at the coming to the end of their long journey. For there is no true worship without that sense that you finally found what you've been looking for all of your life. Our journey begins where the wise men's ended. Like them, we have found a wisdom not to ponder but to worship, a wisdom that is not a matter of words, but who is the word. This wisdom has everything to do with life because he is the life. He gives us wisdom because he gives himself the Magi journey to Jesus, but our journey is with Jesus, a sacred In a long, long journey, we have so little to give, but so much to receive from the babe born in Bethlehem. So we ponder Jesus. We come and we worship him. We open our hearts to him, our our treasure, uh, not indifferent, not antagonistic, and uh, and desire that the Lord would use our lives to, again, like the wise men, not just coming and worshiping, but like the shepherds going out and and sharing with others that the king has, has been born. Let's pray. Father, we do just uh, rejoice in in your birth. Uh, We're past Christmas, but uh, the Christmas story continues here in in Matthew's gospel. And Lord, we we thank you for your your leading and guiding uh, these these men, however many there were, uh, to you. You continue to lead and guide uh, men and women and children to you all over the world. Sometimes they, they, they have a lot of information. They might have a Bible. They might have a New Testament. They might simply have a, 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 a track that someone has, uh, has given them. And uh, Lord, but uh, uh, you're so faithful that if someone is open, someone wanting to know you, Lord, you reveal yourself to them. And we, we thank you for that, for that goodness and that graciousness. You don't have to do that. It's not required of you, Lord, but uh, you're... Uh, We just so cherish your word that you've revealed to us, Lord. We pray that you continue to reveal yourself to our hearts and to men and women around us and use us to to give your word out to them, Lord. God, as we now uh, gather in in your name to share communion this uh, first Sunday of the year, Lord, we pray that uh, you'd use our remembrance of the elements of your death uh, to just establish in, in our hearts, Lord, our 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 love for you, our desire to worship and open our treasures to you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. In these desperate times In these darkened days Though we try and try and try We all will fall in some way Struggling toward the light, we are all running toward your voice, striving for the prize to come to your throne.
Let the oil of gladness flow down from your throne. Put on the garments of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Your joy is my strength alone, my strength alone. So I'll put our hands together. Make these broken, weary bones rise to dance again. Wet this dry and thirsty land with a river. Lord, our eyes are fixed on you, and we are waiting for your garden of grace as we praise your name. Put on the garments of praise for the spirit. Stop holding up 